John Kennedy was the first self-selected president. He would not have become president if uh, he'd gone through the normal channels, and he, he refused to go through the normal channels because he always thought he would die young. He had, he had the last rites of the church uh, a couple of times, and he had had bad health his whole life. And he, uh, uh, he couldn't and wouldn't wait his turn. And I would argue that that changed America. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bob Walker speaking from Dallas Love Field. My assignment that day was to cover the arrival of the Kennedys at Love Field, formation of the motorcade, and stay at Love Field until they came back. And the crowd yelled, and the President of the United States. Keep in mind, first of all, uh, the president was only going to be here, you know, two and a half, three hours. It was a noon event. He was coming for the lunch at the Trade Mart. So the entire city staff was involved in covering the Kennedy visit. This was big. This was the story, a huge story in Dallas for all kinds of obvious reasons. So every one of us were involved in some way. I had the camera uh, uh, coming in, in line with... Uh, uh, the party, but uh, here comes Kennedy, and in holding the uh, the camera, I had to make a decision as to whether you know uh, who I really wanted to shake hands with, and so I thought about it, and I thought, well, if I shake hands with Kennedy, uh, I'll be shaking the camera and probably won't get as good a picture. So I said, well, I'll just shake hands with Johnson and, and take the picture of Kennedy. We flew to Dallas to Love Field. We got in the bus, started the, the parade downtown, started the parade downtown. All of the activity, at, as you've seen in your images, at the airport was joyous, anticipation. When we started downtown all the way in, the crowds kept getting thicker, thicker, you know people hanging out of windows. That was one of the things that hadn't shown up that much in images. Oh, you could see them all the way up the buildings, hanging out over enormous show, great show. The crowds were enthusiastic, waving. Mrs. Kennedy had on a really cute pink outfit and Governor Connolly and his wife were in the, in the back seat. And, uh, Governor Connolly always looked very, very handsome. And Kennedy, of course, was a guy that uh, could be a, could have been a male model and, and sold clothes very nicely. He was always a good looking chap. It was just one of the, one of the best of times. You had a feeling that you were part of, a, of an important national event, something that might even be a little bit historic. When they turned the corner, that of course is when the world changed. First shot, big explosion. I remember turning to Terry and said something about, yeah, that's a firecracker, but also glanced up. The sound had come from in front and up and glanced up at the fifth floor where the guys were hanging out of the window, looking up and pointing up. And then, boom, the second shot. And Kennedy and his arms went up and that, uh, I understand it's a classic reflex action and he, tilted slightly to the left and Jackie moved towards him. And it, it wasn't, you know, a split second later, the third shot, it was obvious that he had been hit and slumped and then the car stopped momentarily and then took off. When he was shot, he was just as straight from me as you are. And he, he, he looked straight at me and I just, you know, it, it was, electric to think that I'd tan and all that beautiful hair and everything, you know, and the shots came and he slumped down, his hair went up and she jumped up and all that. And, and as they left, I, I went back in the building. While I was milling around in the crowd, a woman with a transistor radio began to cry. And I, about the same time, I heard sirens coming over Stimmons. And she said, he's been hit, he's been hit. And I said, who's been hit? And she said, the president. And I thought, rock, bottle, and I never thought gun. 
and I went on to the luncheon. We were waiting for the president and the governor to come, and we hear all these sirens like crazy. And at first we think nothing of it because we knew he'd have a big motorcade. Only the problem is they kept going because they were heading for Parkland. I was in the operating room uh, as an anesthesiologist taking care of a patient. It was a fairly long case. Uh, we were listening to WRR, which is a classical music station. There was no news on that station uh, prior to the time that we actually heard sirens. I have a, st a bit of a st strange sense of humor, and I said something about, well, Kennedy's coming to visit us, which was sort of an ironic statement to make, but it, but it actually happened. When I walked in the room, JFK, I was the, the, the uh, third uh, physician in the room. Malcolm Perry was there fairly soon after that or was there and, and the issue then was just getting him undressed. We were trying to resuscitate uh, our hero and the President of the United States so we're doing everything we could to save his life and that was our concentration. We were not at that moment nor you know were we aware of anything other than the President was here and was was fatally injured. You walk, to, you walk to the Associated Press teletype, which turned out news from all over the world just constantly. And, uh, and Tommy couldn't resist going every hour or so, going to the, uh, the AP uh, ticker to find out what was going on. He was there when the flash came through. and. I sh he shouted to me, Kennedy's been shot in Dallas. And I leaped from behind my desk and ran out, and we both were looking at this machine, and he uttered one sentence, how fast can you get to Dallas? I was in a, dining, in a restaurant in Houston and uh, having lunch with one of my accounts. And uh, they suddenly interrupted the Muzak, the uh, entertainment that the restaurant provides with, uh, well, elevator music as it's called also. Uh, they stopped the music uh, suddenly and you heard uh, in the background, you heard a, a commentary uh, about uh, Dallas and the parade and the shooting. And how very quickly all the talk quieted down and you could understand, the, you could hear the commentary. The silence was, uh, was, was such a profound experience as it was in the market hall at that time, at the trademark, uh, because at that moment in, in life, it just stops. People don't talk, and people filed out, some of them weeping, some of them, uh, most of the people, just not knowing what, uh, what their emotions were. Gosh, this place just stopped for over a week. Nobody did anything. We were all, we were, we were such in shock. It was just horrible. I've had, nothing's ever affected this area more than that has. We did not go back to the office for almost a whole week, and that was right downtown Dallas. But that was one of the saddest, saddest things that has ever happened to Dallas. I mean, Dallas is my home, always has been. I guess I felt a, a bit of a personal stake in the, the uh, public <laughs> relations or public um, perception of Dallas. I was in L.A. not long after the assassination and people were throwing bricks at cars with Texas license plates and they were castigating Texans, you know, and Dallasites, we hate you, you know, and, and uh, that's just a human reaction. But uh, you just don't think it can happen in your, in your city. And uh, I mean, Dallas is still my favorite city ever and to think that it happened there. I began planning 
activities in Dallas uh, in the peace movement. And uh, the most memorable, uh, the most memorable event was uh, we planned this march from the LTV missile factory in Fort Worth to, uh, to the Kennedy assassination site. And about 70 of us began the march in, in Fort Worth and we marched all along the highway um, from Fort Worth to Dallas. And then in Dallas, we went down to Dealey Plaza and had a rally. So we felt that, you know, Kennedy, uh, I didn't know him, never met him, but for some he became our hero. You know, he stood for something. You know, apparently he stood for more than we realized because he got killed. So I think in this instance, you know, we were saying, well, he, if you really want to sh show that you're in a progressive city, you really want to show that, you know, that you regret having to had the president killed in this place, what better way than to lower the color line, open up your facilities, public accommodations, facilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now, now that we have a Texan in the White House, see, Johnson took over. You know, this, this was the rationale behind it. The, the black community had a great feeling for President Kennedy. Uh, it was unusual to have a president like that. He, he was a great guy, and we admired him and also his brother, Bobby. It was a sad day when they were assassinated, but we still have great reverence for the Kennedys. Yes, he was a hero. It was the 60s. Uh, it was more a change we needed for our country. And uh, his election was just a, a new, I say a new day, a new beginning. We're moving out of the past into a new future. And then Kennedy, uh, uh, his stance, then Lyndon Johnson coming in with the Great Society. Uh, even the civil rights movement during the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, lots of events prior to that, uh, we saw uh, evidence of things changing in this country. This was a building which was uh, considered by many people as being a blight on the city of Dallas, particularly uh, people who loved the city of Dallas, which I did, did and do. Um, but a lot of people felt it should be torn down so there'd be no more evidence of it. I felt that this would always be an historic building. The fact that it was one of the worst things that happened in the city of the, the, in the history of the city of Dallas was to me beside the point. If the county's going to buy this building, something has to be done to protect this floor. It's historic. And that was my introduction to what was happening with the county. And the county from the outset felt that the sixth floor had to be protected and until until they understood what should be done on the sixth floor. And as, you know, the historical group and the historical commission, it sort of fell, you know, up to us to put the, something together to even think about it, to even think about the sixth floor. So um, that um, started a, a long, long journey. People really somehow seemed to think that if they got rid of this building, it would somehow all go away. I was particularly impressed with the amount of video and sort of the quality of the interpretation. I mean, I think, to me, it's evolved very positively. Nancy Cheney was on the, uh, the original board of directors and her name is on the plaque out there uh, on the, in the hallway. And uh, she and I had discussed, uh, uh, we were doing some oral histories of our own at the time, and she and I had discussed that the, that the sixth floor ought to be doing oral his histories. So I got together a list of people that I was, thought we'd better get as soon as we could, because if we didn't, they would be gone after a few years. And so sure enough, a lot of the people that we have interviewed have died since then. And we were able to get quite a few interviews and, and I'm glad to see you're carrying on the program. And I, I think it's something that will be invaluable to uh, students of, uh, of history in the future, I, I really do.